Okay, that's better. So I titled my talk today, How is Your Attitude? Our attitude plays an important role in how we, how we look at our world and how we interact with it. And so, um, like I often ask our New Start guests, I want to ask you a same question. Do you mind if I tell you a story? <laughs> Let's start with a story. This is um, Lieutenant Charles Plum, a United States Navy pilot. He served in the Vietnam conflict. He flew an A-4 jet and um, was a fighter pilot. He flew over 75 combat missions in Vietnam. So he was a busy guy, active guy. Here's a picture of the USS Kitty Hawk. And those are two A-4 jets flying over that um, naval vessel. This was the carrier that he was based off of. On one of his missions, Plum's jet was struck by a surface-to-air missile. He was able, fortunately, to eject from the plane and parachute out. But unfortunately, where he landed, he was in enemy, enemy territory. He ended up being captured by the Viet Cong. He then spent six years in North Vietnamese prison from 1967 to 1972, what became known as the Hanoi Hilton. He was abused. He was persecuted. He was beaten almost every single day. And he says that when he got out eventually in 1972, he talks about his experiences. He had to use positive thoughts and gratitude in order to be able to survive that harrowing experience. So he talks about that and shares with others how that helped him. Several years later, he um, was out. He had survived this ordeal and he'd gotten back home and he was out one evening eating with his wife in a restaurant and a man came up to him and says, are you Charles Plum? He says, you flew jet fighters in Vietnam from the aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. You were shot down. He says to him, well, how did you know this? The man replied, I packed your parachute. Plum gasped in surprise and gratitude. The guy says, I guess it worked. Plum says, absolutely it worked. If it hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. Plum could not sleep that night thinking about this man. He kept wondering what he looked like in a naval uniform. Blue uniform, bib in the back, white hat, bell-bottom trousers, did he even recognize that man when he was on the ship? I wondered how many times, I'm sorry, I wondered how many times I may have seen him and had not even said good morning to him. How are you? I was a fighter pilot and he was just a sailor. Plum thought of the many hours the sailor had spent at a long wooden table in the bowels of the ship, carefully, weaving the shrouds and folding the silks of each shoot, holding in his hands each time the fate of someone that he really didn't know. You know, we all are like that. We do things that impact others, and sometimes we may have their lives in our very hands. Plum now asks his audience, who packs your parachute? Everyone has someone who provides what they need to make it through the day. Are we recognizing those people? Are we thankful for them? We all have many different parachutes. Plum points out that he needed many different parachutes while he was in prison. He needed his physical parachute to make it from the air to the ground. He then needed to have a strong mental parachute. 
He needed an emotional parachute because he was always under attack. And he needed his spiritual parachute. He called on all these supports before he reached safety. Are you appreciative of the people who pack your parachutes? Look out for them. They may not always be evident to you. You may not know who your parachute packers are. Sometimes in the daily challenges that life gives us, we miss what is really important. We may fail to say hello, to say please or thank you. We may fail to congratulate something on something wonderful that has happened to them, to give them a compliment, or just to do something for someone else without looking for something in return. Do something nice for no good reason. As you walk through this coming week, I want you to think about and recognize the people who pack your parachutes. There's lots of them. I want to say that we need to have an attitude of gratitude. We need to be thankful for not only the big things, but also for the little things that happen in our lives. We have much to be thankful for. First to God, because we would be nowhere without him, but then also to those who help us along our way. Even if we do not have all the things that we want, we are more blessed than many. Amen. We hear so many stories of others who have it much worse than we do. We need to be thankful not only to God, but also to those around us. You know, St. Francis of Assisi said it this way, If you don't have everything you want, be thankful for the things you don't have that you don't want. <laughs> Think about it. It's deep. If you don't have everything you want, be thankful for the things you don't have that you don't want. There are many things that all of us don't want. And praise the Lord that for most of us, we don't have those things. So we need to cultivate a positive attitude, an attitude of caring. I want to suggest to you four reasons that we should be grateful. Four reasons that we should be thankful. First of all, I believe that God deserves our gratitude. We owe so much to him. We would be nowhere without God and the things that he has done for us. So I hope you have your Bibles. Let's, uh, let's open our Bibles. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians. Margaret shared this in her, in her story, but I want us to look at a few things together. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. And it says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And then in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, if we are followers of Christ, meaning we are Christians, then we have a responsibility to be thankful. He's commissioning us to do this because this is his will, the will of God through Christ concerning us. So how do we be thankful when things are bad? Well, first, we need to pray. Pray how? Without ceasing. Because when we pray, it gives us a different perspective on our lives. And as we pray, it helps us to be able to rejoice evermore. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. Hebrews 13, verse 15 says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So our lips need to be saying good things. We can't just be feeling it in our heart. We need to share it with others. And then verse 16, But to do good and to communicate, forget not, 
For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So we need to share what we've experienced. We need to share the testimonies that we have. We need to share what God has done in our lives. Amen. And then let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20. And it says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have much to be thankful for. We have much to be thankful for. And it is to God and Christ, because without them, we would have nothing. And let's turn to the Old Testament, Psalms 100, which was read in our scripture reading. Psalms chapter 100, we'll just read the whole thing. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord is God. He is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. So God has blessed us and we need to be thankful for that. We need to appreciate that. We need to realize that it is only by his mercy that we are able to do what we do. I'm sure you've all heard of the, uh, the poem, The Sands of Time, where there's two tracks of footsteps in the sand, and then there comes a point where there's only one set of footprints. And the person asks God, how did you forsake me like that? And the answer is, well, I didn't forsake you. That's when I was carrying you through your trial. So in time of need, we need to rely upon God. To all who are reaching out, to feel the guiding hand of God. Are we reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God? Moments of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. When you feel like there's no help, when you feel like you're all alone, when you feel the discouragement of life, realize that that is when divine help is the closest to you. They will look back with thankfulness upon the darkest part of their way, from every temptation and every trial, he'll bring them forth with firmer faith and a richer experience. You know, God sends trials to us to mold us and to shape us, to change us, to change our characters. And so we live in a world that's full of sin. That means that bad things are going to happen. We can't avoid those. What do we do, though, when they happen? Well, we have to have uh, an attitude to approach these trials and temptations and things that we face. Bad things may happen to us, but God is able to bring good out of everything. Look at the stories in the Bible where these bad things were happening, yet in the end it worked out for good because God had a plan through all of it. We all face trials and challenges, and things do not go the way that we may want them to. But by God's grace, he's able to use them and change them for our good. You know, um, my grandfather used to say a lot of sayings, and I'm not sure where this one came from, but I like it, and uh, I heard it many times from him. It says, from the day you are born until you ride in the hearse, there's nothing so bad that it couldn't be worse. Think about it. As long as we have life, we have something to be thankful for. You know? We, we, no matter what our walk is, no matter what our trial is, as long as we have life, we have something to be thankful for. And we need to dedicate that life back to God. I want to talk a little bit about the influence of one. You know, the Bible tells us the story of the ten lepers. Leprosy was one of the worst diseases you could have in Bible times because it was considered a, 
an unclean disease. And God wanted to keep his people clean. So if you had an unclean disease, you couldn't be around everybody else. You couldn't be around a, the rest of the, of the population, the rest of society. So leprosy was a disease that left people ostracized from Jewish society. They had to wear a bell attached to their clothing, and when they walked around, if people came by them, they would ring the bell and say, unclean, unclean, unclean. Can you imagine how that makes you feel? People walk to the other side of the road. You can't eat with your family. You can't sleep with your family. You can't touch them, hug them, kiss them, anything because you are now unclean. Let's look at the story in Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. And starting in verse 11, let's just read through some of it briefly. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers which stood afar off. They knew the rules of engagement. They knew they couldn't walk right up to Jesus. They had to call out to him. So they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. The priests were the medical overseers, if you would. And so they could declare if somebody had the disease or if they were healed. So these men, Jesus hadn't done anything yet. He just told them to go show themselves to the priest. They had a decision to make. They had to decide if they had faith in what God was telling them to do and what Jesus was telling them to do. The first step of faith was to start walking towards the priests. And what they found is, as they walked, as it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. So they had to step out in order to get the healing. Okay? And the Bible says in verse 15, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. He was not a Jew. He was a foreigner, a stranger. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not now found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, and go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. So, here is our lesson from one leper. These lepers were so corrupted by disease that they had been restricted from society lest they should contaminate others. Their limits had been prescribed by the authorities. They knew what they had to do. Jesus comes within their sight and earshot, and in their great suffering they cry unto him who alone has power to relieve them. Jesus bids them show themselves to the priests. They have faith to start on their way, believing in the power of Christ to heal them. And it continues. As they go on their way, they realize that the horrible disease has left them. But only one of them has feelings of gratitude. Only one feels his deep indebtedness to Christ for this great work wrought for him. This one returns, praising God, and in the greatest humiliation, falls at the feet of Christ. Acknowledging with thankfulness the work wrought for him. And this man was a stranger. The other nine were Jews. So, I really like this next portion of this passage from Councils on Health. It says, for the sake of this one man who would make a right use of the blessing of health, Jesus healed the whole ten. The nine passed on without appreciating the work done and rendered no grateful thanks to Jesus for doing the work. So because of one man 
And what he would do with that blessing, Jesus healed the whole group. This man packed the parachutes for nine other men. Who is packing your parachute? And are you packing anybody else's parachute? What kind of influence do we have in this world? But as powerful as that was, that's not even the biggest blessing of this whole thing. Let me read on. The application to today. Thus will the physicians of the Health Institute have their efforts treated. This hit me. You know, sometimes as I work with New Start, I feel that we have to help everybody. We have to save everybody. We have to teach everybody everything we can. Listen to what this says. But if in their labor to help suffering humanity, one out of 20 makes a right use of the benefits received and appreciates their efforts in his behalf, the physician should feel grateful and satisfied. Yeah, it's powerful. If one life out of 10 is saved and the one soul out of 100 is saved in the kingdom of God, all connected with the institute will be amply repaid for all their efforts. Wow. Wow. And it continues. All their anxiety and care will not be wholly lost. If the King of Glory, catch this now, if the King of Glory, the majesty of heaven, worked for suffering humanity and so few appreciated his divine aid, the physicians and helpers at the Institute should blush to complain if their feeble efforts are not appreciated by all and seem to be thrown away on some. Wow. <laughs> we have much to be thankful for, and we need to work. We need to work in the lines that our master worked. If he was willing to work to save just a few, who should we be any different to want to save everyone? So again... I think we have four reasons to be grateful. The first is that God deserves our gratitude. The second is that our gratitude is an example for others. What kind of an example are we showing to those around us? So let's look at some verses again. Psalm 34. Let's look there briefly. Psalm 34, and starting with verse 1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Are we inviting others to have an appreciation of God? Are we inviting others to share in magnifying the Lord? And I'm going to skip down for the sake of time to verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye he saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and, the suffer, and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. God has promised that he will not withhold anything from us that is for our good. We may want things and not get them, but he will not withhold from us things that are for our good. Let's turn to the New Testament now to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And verses 1 through 6, it says... We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. We have a responsibility to live up to what God has called us to. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased himself not, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached 
thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We have a responsibility to live up to what God has called us to. And then 1 Thessalonians 5. Chapter 9, or ver chapter 5, verse 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. So we need to share with others how God has worked in our lives, and we need to comfort each other as needed. Help in Daily Living says this, If you do not feel lighthearted and joyous, do not talk of your feelings. If you don't have something good to say, just hold it. Cast no shadow upon the lives of others. A cold, sunless religion never draws souls to Christ. It drives them away from him into the nets that Satan has spread for the feet of the strain. Instead of thinking of your discouragements, think of the power you can claim in Christ's name. Let your imagination take hold upon things unseen. Let your thoughts be directed to the evidences of the great love of God for you. Faith can endure trial, resist temptation, bear up under disappointment. Jesus lives as our advocate, and all is ours that his mediation secures. Find the positive things around you. If you look for negatives, you're going to find them. But if you look for positives, you'll also find those as well. Appreciate the things that God has done for us. You know, we can learn to change our outlook so that we can begin to believe that we do have a role in altering our lives. We have a choice. We have a choice to make. And how will we choose? We don't have to become victims. Optimism is not the consequences of what others do to me. You know, my wife sees this in her work, that late, young ladies will come in and they'll, they'll have a downcast spirit because somebody said something or looked at them or did something or so on. Well, our, our emotions should not be based upon what others do to us. We need to have a control in our outlook. It's our outlook, the way that we look at life that shapes our world. We have to own our viewpoint and take responsibility for it. We all face trials and we all face challenges. And the things don't always go the way we want. But is your life packing someone else's parachute? Or is your life taking the wind out of their sails? What kind of witness are you showing them? And one last verse here. Psalms 141, verses 3 and 4. And it says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. Incline not my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked words with men that work iniquity. Let me not eat of their dainties. Our words are very powerful. Every day of life is freighted with responsibilities which we must bear. Every day our words and our acts are making impressions upon those with whom we associate. 
How great the need that we set a watch upon our lips and guard carefully our steps. One reckless movement, one imprudent step, and the surging waves of some strong temptation may sweep a soul into the downward path. We cannot gather up the thoughts we have planted in human minds. If they have been evil, we may have set in motion a train of circumstances, a tide of evil, which we are powerless to stay. But words can be powerful in a negative way. They can also be powerful in a positive way. On the other hand, if by our example we aid others in the development of good principles, we give them power to do good. In their turn, they exert the same beneficial influence over others. Thus, hundreds and thousands are helped by our unconscious influence. The true follower of Christ strengthens the good purposes of all with whom he comes in contact. Before an unbelieving, sin-loving world, he reveals the power of God's grace and the perfection of his character. Are our words making an impact on others' lives? The things we say and do, others are watching whether you realize it or not. So we need to have an influence. We need to help others. I remember that my mother used to say this poem to me. It has to do with our attitude. When you've work to do, lad, do it with a will. They who reach the top, lad, first must climb the hill. Standing at the foot, lad, gazing at the sky. How will you get up, lad, if you never try? Though you stumble off, lad, never be downcast. Try and try again, lad. You'll succeed at last. Our attitude is affected by our gratitude. Our attitude affects our motivation, and our motivation impacts our success and how much we are willing to witness to others. Number three, an attitude of gratitude brings us joy. So Psalms 16 talks about this. And starting at verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall also rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is what? fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. But you know, if we're not in a relationship with God, we don't see and appreciate that fullness of joy. We don't see those special times as pleasures. We may see them as a burden. We may not appreciate the value of them. The world doesn't appreciate the value of these things. And if we are like the world, then we lose an appreciation for them as well. And Proverbs 17, verse 22, which says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. How is our attitude? The Ministry of Healing says regarding this verse, Gratitude, rejoicing, benevolence, and trust in God's love and care. These are health's greatest safeguard. To the Israelites, they were to be the very keynote of life. We need to have the right attitude if we want to go and spend eternity with God. So, number four, an attitude of gratitude makes us healthier. Let's look at Psalms 115. Psalms 115. I'll just cover it briefly. 
Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore the heathen say, Where is now their God? But their God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And skipping down to verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. And he will bless the house of Aaron. It is the law of the human mind that by beholding, we become changed. The things we focus on, the things we allow to enter into our minds, change us. Man will rise no higher than his conceptions of truth, purity, and holiness. If the mind is never exalted above the level of humanity, it is not uplifted by faith to contemplate infinite wisdom and love. The man will be constantly sinking lower and lower. Patriarchs and prophets says it this way, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. Such was the spirit that pervaded Israel's song of deliverance, and it is the spirit that should dwell in the hearts of all who love and fear God. In freeing our souls from the bondage of sin, God has wrought for us a deliverance greater than that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Like the Hebrew host, we should praise the Lord with heart and soul and voice for his wonderful works to the children of man. Those who dwell upon God's great mercies and are not unmindful of his lesser gifts will put on the girdle of gladness and make melody in their hearts to the Lord. And it continues, the daily blessings that we receive from the hand of God and above all else, the death of Jesus to bring happiness and heaven within our reach should be a theme for constant gratitude. What compassion, what matchless love has God showed to us, lost sinners in connecting us with himself to be to him a peculiar treasure. What a sacrifice has been made by our Redeemer that we may be called the children of God. We should praise God for the blessed hope held out before us in the great plan of redemption. We should praise him for the heavenly inheritance and for his rich promises. Praise him that Jesus lives to intercede for us. So they did some research at the University of Michigan. And what they found is People who have an attitude of gratitude are more forgiving. So forgiving others has a stronger link with better self-reported mental and physical health. When we hold on to hostility and the resulting stress it produces, it can weaken our immune system and thereby increase our risk of heart disease and cancer. John Wooden, the famous basketball coach at UCLA, said it this way, Things work out best for the people who make the best of the way things work out. You know, if we are able to work with how God is leading in our lives, if we're not always fighting against it, then we have less stress, and it helps us to have more gratitude. Robert Emmons is a professor of psychology at UC Davis, and he's one of the foremost authorities on the topic of gratitude. His research shows that gratitude improves our emotional and our physical health, and it can strengthen relationships and communities. Without gratitude, life can be lonely. It can be depressing and impoverished. Gratitude enriches human life. It elevates, energizes, inspires, and transforms. People are moved, opened, and humbled through expression of gratitude. As a result, he says, people experience significant improvement in several areas of their lives, including relationships, academics, energy level, and even dealing with tragedy and loss. But we have to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. 
Gratitude is a chosen attitude. It's not just a natural response. We must be willing to recognize and acknowledge that we are the recipients of an unearned benefit. Emmons research indicates that gratitude is not merely a positive emotion. It also improves your health if you cultivate it. People must give up a victim mentality and overcome a sense of entitlement and deservedness. So they looked at ways to measure gratitude. Grateful people report higher levels of positive emotions, life satisfaction, vitality, optimism, and lower levels of depression and stress. People with a strong disposition towards gratitude have the capacity to be empathetic and to take the perspective of others. In order to care for others, we need to understand their perspective. Those who regularly attend religious services and engage in religious activities such as prayer, reading religious material, are more likely to be grateful. Grateful people are more likely to acknowledge a belief in the interconnectedness of all of life and a commitment to and responsibility to others. In other words, people who are followers of Christ care for other people. They feel that they need to help other people. Grateful individuals place less importance on material goods and are more likely to share their possessions with others relative to less grateful people. In other words, they're more likely to judge their own and others' success, not in terms of, of possessions accumulated, but what they do to help others. They're less envious of people with wealth. Those who kept gratitude journals on a weekly basis, writing down the things you are grateful for, exercised more regularly, hence they got healthier, they reported fewer physical symptoms, they felt better about their lives as a whole, and they were more optimistic about the upcoming week. Kind of makes you want to start writing down a few things to be thankful for to God. Participants who kept gratitude lists were more likely to have made progress towards important personal goals, whether they be academic or interpersonal or health-based goals. So writing things down that you are grateful for actually helps you to achieve your goals better. A daily gratitude intervention. They went through some self-guided exercises with young adults, and they found that it resulted in higher reported levels of positive states of alertness, enthusiasm, determination, attentiveness, and energy. So taking the time to think about grateful things actually is beneficial to you. And participants in the daily gratitude condition were more likely to report having helped someone with a personal problem or having offered emotional support to somebody else. They looked at a group of young adults who had neuromuscular disease and they put them on a 21-day gratitude intervention where they had them do things to improve their gratitude. And what they found is greater amounts of high energy positive moods, a greater sense of feeling connected to others, more optimistic rating of one's life, and better sleep duration and sleep quality relative to a control group who was not doing any of those activities. I want you, though, to understand that gratitude is not just indebtedness. There's a difference. In a narrative study, people who write about being indebted to others, I owe somebody for whatever, report higher levels of anger and lower levels of appreciation, happiness, and love compared to those who were just grateful in general. The experience of indebtedness is less likely to lead to a desire to approach or make contact with others relative to an experience of gratefulness. When you feel grateful, you want to share what you have. You want to share what you've experienced. When you're indebted, you feel like you have a responsibility. You feel like you have to pay back that debt if you can. So indebtedness tends to be more of a negative psychological state than gratitude. 
They find that gratitude decreases stress hormones. 45 adults were taught to cultivate an appreciation and other positive emotions. And they studied their salivary DHEA and cortisol levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone in our bodies, and DHEA is one of the most highly produced um, hormones from the adrenal gland. It can be metabolized into estrogen or testosterone, and it's one of the most prevalent steroids that our body produces. Low DHE levels are associated with many diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, chronic inflammation, Alzheimer's, dementia, and others. So what they found is that there was a mean 23% reduction in cortisol, meaning a reduction in the amount of stress in our lives, and a 100% increase in DHEA. So our bodies were getting healthier just by doing these appreciation exercises. 80% of the participants had less heart rate variability, meaning that their, heart, their body was not under as much stress, and they, the techniques seemed to give them overall better health. Another study looking at God, and, and looking at God as a benevolent God versus a God who's out to get you and a dictator, the foundational views that people have of God, their image of God, has an importance on health consequences. So what they found is that these people who had feelings of gratitude, more, the more they traced back to feelings of gratitude and hope, those were part of people's internal working model of God. The images that these people have of God arise in part from the interplay between one, attendance at worship, and two, interaction with fellow church members. So going to church actually is a way to boost your gratitude and to boost your overall health. Because what happens is, as you go to church and interact with people and you gain the blessing from worshiping God, it changes your attitude. So gratitude is associated with better sleep, less depressed mood, less fatigue, and better self-efficiency to maintain cardiac function. They were looking at people who were having congestive heart failure, and they found that their cardiac function improved as they had more gratitude. In the same manner, spiritual well-being, which is connected to gratitude, also is associated with better sleep, less depressed mood, less fatigue, and better self-efficacy to maintain cardiac function. So our bodies get healthier when we have an attitude of gratitude. And I want to just share uh, one last poem with you here. This is um, by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. And I remember my mother used to say this too. It is easy enough to be pleasant when life flows by like a song, but the man worthwhile is one who will smile when everything goes dead wrong. For the test of the heart is trouble, and it always comes with the years. And the smile that is worth the praises of earth is the smile that shines through tears. It is easy to be prudent when nothing tempts you to stray, when without or within no voice of sin is luring your soul away. But it's only a negative virtue until it is tried by fire, and the life that is worth the honor on earth is the one that resists desire. By the cynic, the sad, the fallen, who had no strength for the strife, the world's highway is cumbered today, they make up the sum of life. But the virtue that conquers passion and the sorrow that hides in a smile, it is these that are worth the, honor, the homage on earth, for we find them but once in a while. So again, an attitude of gratitude makes us healthier. Learn to cultivate your gratitude, not only to God, but to others around you. Please stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, 559, Now Thank We All Our God, 559. 